This video is supported by Aiming Hobbies. Click the link in the description below. So here's the thing, there's always sort of been a rivalry between America and Europe between, well, everything. Especially when it comes to anything motorsport related. As you can see, I like Eurocars. Anyway, this also extends to RC like anything else, usually showing up on the track but sometimes spilling over into situations like this. With that being said, there's also a huge difference in how Europeans and North Americans handle RC as a whole, especially racing. And that's what we're going to be going over in this video. Now, a few caveats for this video. I'll mainly be covering North America and European differences, but I will be mentioning differences with different countries within Europe, along with some mentions of East Asia and Australia here and there if it makes sense. Also, before we begin, I'd like to remind you about the one supporting this channel, Ain Main Hobbies. Anything you guys purchase using the link in the description below will directly support this channel as well. With that out of the way, why don't we get started? You see, in the Americas, there's a very large variety of track surfaces that track owners have used over the years, but the number one track surface in America is very much any form of dirt, be it loose farm dirt to hard and concrete-like surfaces, and everything in between. Here in the Americas, even though there are very successful carpet tracks out there like Beachline RC in Cocoa, Florida, dirt is still the most popular and supported surface by far. There are a few reasons for this, one of them being the fact that the dirt content in the US specifically on the East Coast, is very high in clay content. What does this mean? Well, to put it simply, it means that it's much easier to shape the dirt into a desired shape, and when you're done, it's much easier for it to hold that shape over time. Even after a literal monsoon and the track being underwater, this track you're seeing now was able to be shaped and made into a raceable track thanks to the higher clay content. Another reason why RC tracks in the US are usually dirt is the fact that Americans can be somewhat stubborn. We like our engines in the V8 shape. Our end race tracks in the oval shape, unless they're motocross, in which we like them very loamy and dirty. This sort of mindset extended to RC as well. Just look at the end of my Evolution of RC Tracks video where I highlighted some funny responses to the If Martin Skill Worlds being held on a turf track. Anyway. Having a dirt track in America is for the most part more desirable for the fact that off-road racing in America means, well, dirt tracks. This has recently started to change over time for reasons I'll get into later, but for the time being, dirt tracks are still the most desirable track to race on for most racers in the US for both 10th and 8th scale, and said racers would like to stay it that way for at least in a certain level. Another thing about RC tracks in North America is that they are usually designed and modeled after motocross tracks rather than traditional race tracks you'd see in something like F1 or GT3. Even this tends to vary sometimes though depending on where you live in the US, as West Coast tracks tend to follow this trend a lot more than East Coast ones do. The last thing about RC tracks in North America is that things tend to be a bit bigger in a few ways, most notably in jumps and especially in 8th scale. If you were to look at a big race event track at both US and Europe, you'd see that the airtime on said American tracks is much longer than Euro tracks. Once again, this ties back to US tracks being based more on motocross tracks rather than racing circuits. Moving on to Euro style tracks, we'll begin with their surfaces. This is particularly where 10th and 8th scale racing gets split even more in terms of surfaces than they already are here in the US. You see, 10th scale is usually run on carpet and astroturf almost exclusively. There are exceptions to this rule, such as the Huddy Arena, and a few others I'm probably forgetting, but that's about it. Every other permanent and not so permanent track, we'll get to that point later, are usually either some form of carpet or astroturf. Like I mentioned before, this is because the dirt there is not entirely ideal for building tracks the same way they are built here. This is also the case of lots of Asian tracks as well, like the Yatapi Arena, which went to carpet not too long ago. For A-scale tracks, things go one of two ways. Either the track is very loose and dusty due to the lack of clay content in the dirt, 
or the track has been treated so much that it's pretty much like driving on concrete. There is no real in-between. Another thing that is more common for 8 scale tracks is the use of mixed surfaces. This can take many forms, from having the jump bases and landing areas be covered in some sort of carpet or turf, having parts of the track surface made of actual concrete or bricks, to everything in between. There's a lot of variation here. This is also true for most tracks in places like most of Asia, including countries like Japan or the Philippines. Australian tracks, on the other hand, tend to be a mix of American and European ideals. Even though most of the tracks are built using dirt, their dirt layouts are usually closely resembled to European-style tracks, something you'd see in the southeast of the United States, too. Now that we got the layouts and track surfaces out of the way, let's move on to the race programs and how they function. How tracks and race programs are run here in the United States is very different compared to how they're run around the world. The first piece of evidence pertaining to the previous statement has a lot to do with how practice is usually run. You see, during like 90% of big races here in the United States, and pretty much all club races, practice is done as open practice or controlled practice. For club races, open practice is more common as everything really works on the honor roll system. Don't run on the track for too long, and always marshal for at least as long as you've practiced. If everything was perfect, this system would be perfect. This is of course not the case, and most of the time you have people not wanting to marshal, and having people doing long practice stints and not marshalling afterward because there's no real punishment for not doing so. For large events, you usually have something more akin to a controlled practice. The way it usually works is you get up on the driver's stand and practice for an allotted amount of time. You step down and marshal for the next group, and if you don't, you're penalized a lap in your qualifiers. Seemed like a sound system, until too many people try to practice at the same time. This is what leads to lines that look like this. You're essentially at an amusement park in line waiting for a ride that lasts at most 6 minutes. This isn't really an issue isolated to one big US event, however. This affects most big boy races with entry counts over a thousand, like Psycho Nitro Blast or Silver State. There are some events that do things differently, like for example the blocks of practice at events like North Georgia Shootout. Things in the rest of the world that, for the most part, are very different. Open practice outside of maybe dedicated practice days isn't really a thing. Controlled practice is usually the way that European tracks are usually run, and this is also the case with most of Asia and Australia as well. There's also scheduled practice sessions before the racing begins where people are scheduled to run a specific time, which in my opinion is probably my favorite system. Everyone gets an equal amount of practice time, and there's no having to wait in line for an hour. Another thing that many people in the US may be culture shocked by is the fact that RC tracks usually aren't a business for the most part. They are organizations where members pay a monthly or yearly fee along with track maintenance being done by volunteers. This is for a few reasons. Okay, mostly tax reasons, but there are a few other reasons. One of which segues into my next point. Most tracks and events in Europe and UK specifically aren't usually held at Pont Mernet tracks, more specifically with Tenska racing as most of that is done on AstroTurf or carpet. Usually what happens is a venue is rented out for the day or weekend depending on how long the race event is, a track is built in a day as building a modular carpet or AstroTurf track is much easier than molding dirt or clay into a track, the track is run on race day or race weekend, and the whole thing is torn down after the event is over, usually in a few hours. This is sort of similar to how a lot of 8 skill events are done here in the US, however on a much smaller scale and usually isn't in the middle of nowhere. Usually convention centers, malls, hotels, and others are the venues for races like these in Europe and the UK. Now this doesn't mean there aren't permanent tracks across the pond, and there are definitely ones upside down, but for event style races, this is generally the norm. 
Moving on to classes, this is where things can get a little bit convoluted and difficult to follow if you're in any part of the world that isn't the US or Canada, so let me explain those first. Starting with 10th scale. You have many different types of classes depending on how many entries there are, and the description of the race director. Usually how you have two different types of classes for a single chassis type, usually mod and stock. Mod classes are allowed to use whatever motor you want so long as it's a 540 size motor. And stock classes are usually limited by blinky mode on the ESC and turn rating on the motor. Once again, remember, less is more when it comes to turn rating. A good example of this would be short course truck and stadium truck. Sometimes they're limited to 17.5 turn motors, and other times they're limited to 13.5. Anyway, you may also have a distinct class meant to separate people who do this as a hobby and those who do it as a day job. This is more common when we touch on 8th scale, but this can happen at larger events for 10th scale too. I know at Masses of Dirt in 2022, there were four different two-wheel drive classes, Stock, Pro Mod, Open Mod, and 40 Plus Mod. This splitting of drivers based on their turn rating, age, or experience is much more common in the premier classes of RC like two-wheel drive and four-wheel drive. With other classes like Stadium Truck and Short Course Truck, this happens less often, but there still usually is a Stock and Mod class respectively. Another thing about 10 scale in the US is that there are more classes are popular and you actually run compared to Europe and the UK. You'd be hard pressed to find a track that consistently runs short course trucks or mini truggy in Europe and UK, but here in the US and Canada, they're run with regular frequency. In summary, there are more classes to be run in the 10 scale world here in the United States. Moving on to 8th scale, things become much more convoluted and subjective. Take for example the premier class, Nitro 8th scale buggy. Like two-wheel drive buggy, there are usually four different classes for nitro buggy at larger events. The difference is, unlike 10th scale where there are actual hardware differences between these subclasses as we'll call them, there are no sub-differences between the subclasses in 8th scale. You could theoretically run Spencer Rivkin's 8th scale nitro buggy in Sportsman if you had a Sportsman level driver behind the wheel. Speaking of which, you have the Sportsman class, Intermediate class, Pro class, and 40 plus on the side. Like I said before, there are no hardware differences between a pro buggy, an intermediate buggy, and a sportsman buggy. They are all the same. It's all based on the skill level on the driver, which as you know can be very arbitrary depending on where you happen to run for a certain event and how large the event is. At a race like North Georgia Shootout, I may be considered a sportsman to intermediate level driver on a good day, but at a national level event, I'm very much at a sportsman level. This doesn't seem too much like a problem until people start complaining about different situations. From people accusing others of sandbagging, to sponsor drivers being in sportsmen, it all becomes a bit of a mess. Also, like in 10th scale, there is another class that is pretty much run only in the US and Canada, and a bit on the upside down land of Australia, and that's Truggy. Truggy, and by extension E-Truggy, are the complementary class compared to Buggy and E-Buggy. I do have an educated theory as to why this is, so if you'd like to hear me ramble for a second or two, feel free to stay. If not, go to this timestamp above. <sighs> like I mentioned before, most of the world's tracks aren't made the same way most American tracks are and are usually much smoother and higher traction, especially compared to Western US tracks in general and general US events like DNC, Silver State, Psycho Nitro Blast, and the TNR Challenge. Even with races like the North Georgia Shootout and a few other small races around the country, you'll see a lot of the track get very blown out and bumpy, and for a buggy, this can be hell. On the other hand, Truggies have a lot of qualities that make them not only better suited for these tracks, but much easier to drive for average racers. For one, they're much wider and longer than your standard 8 scale buggy. This does two things. For one, it makes the car much more stable both at speed and through corners. Also, because they have much larger tires with more of a surface area for tread to dig in, they have a lot more mechanical grip than a buggy even with the same tread pattern and compound. And lastly, because they have much more suspension travel, and because of the aforementioned larger wheels and tires, they're able to handle jumps and bumps much easier than buggies. Also, you have a car that beyond normal maintenance, like bearings and such, you don't really have to chase setup as much out of the box like you would a buggy. Combine all of this and you have a platform that from a design perspective, for the average racer on American style tracks with our ruts, bumps, and big jumps, is superior to a buggy in pretty much every way. The only issue and the reason why they're not as big as buggies are, is for the simple matter of upkeep and cost. Even though you don't have to wrench on them as often as buggies to chase setup, simple upkeep can be expensive. For example, you have wheels and tires. 
A set of pre-mounted Truggy tires can sit you back a solid 100 bucks if you buy from most brands. Combine this with having to buy more shock fluid, changing bearings more often, and said tires not lasting as long due to the Truggies usually having more power than buggies, and you have recipe for big boy bills. Now though that tangent over, why don't we move on to how the rest of the world handles classes. For 10th scale, things are pretty simple. You've got your standard buggy classes of 2-wheel drive and 4-wheel drive buggies, and your standard 2-wheel drive stadium truck, but most of the time it's just the buggies. Another thing about 10th scale in Europe and the UK is the fact that there is pretty much no stock class at all for RC, at least for our one that has much trash in on off-road. I know things may be different for on-road. There's also no 40 plus or sportsman class either. If you're running two-wheel drive buggy, you're running two-wheel drive buggy. If you're running four-wheel drive buggy, you're running four-wheel drive buggy. Another thing that kind of ties into the previous point is the fact that most of the world don't run the same amount of classes that we do in the US. It's not uncommon for some Euro guys to only run one class and that's it, usually two-wheel drive or four-wheel drive. This is also the case with eighth scale as well. There is no sportsman, intermediate, or pro, there is only buggy and e-buggy. This is also so they can put all of their focus into one class so they can hone their skills with said class and really dial their car in as well, rather than spreading their attention across multiple classes and trying to get as much driving time as possible. The last thing I'd like to go over is brand presence around the world in terms of RC. It's easy to say that this or that particular brand is most popular if your area only runs them, but you may be missing what brands are used outside of your region. First off, we have the US. The US is kind of a mixing bowl when it comes to brands being used, and it really depends on what surface you tend to run on and what scale you run. If you run on clay or dirt, you're probably going to find a few more TLR cars around as they tend to excel on those surfaces. For carpet, you'll find more shoe mockers and the occasional x-ray kit here and there, but the most popular brand across all surfaces for 10th scale has got to be associated. For 8th scale though, it's a bit more of a mixing bowl as there's usually only one surface run for 8th scale, that being dirt. But the top brands that I've seen at most club races that I've been to, and larger races as well, have been Techno, Hot Bodies, and Team Associated. On the sides, you usually find S-Works, Kyosho, Losi, and a few others just vibing along. Outside of the US, it really becomes a question of what region you're in. For the UK, for example, you'll be hard pressed to find a club that isn't stacked with Schumacher cars. For Australia, Japan, and the Philippines, you'll be hard pressed to find one that isn't stacked with Yokomo cars. For 8th scale, brands that are popular in the US are usually less popular elsewhere. A good example of this would be the case of Techno. Massively popular in the States, not so much everywhere else. In Southeast Asia, like I mentioned, Japanese brands tend to dominate the landscape like Kyosho and Yokomo for 8th and 10th scale respectively. Now here's the thing. It's fun looking at the differences we have and how we treat this hobby we love, but at the end of the day, we all just enjoy racing toy cars. I could go on and on about the differences in attitudes and skill levels as well, but in the end it wouldn't change that fact. If you made it this far in the video, feel free to comment on what region you tend to race in and what you think about racing as a whole, and any differences you might think. I do read all my comments. I'd also like to thank you guys for watching and supporting me for this long. I really do appreciate it. Speaking of which, if you'd like to support me further, you can check out my Patreon. I post updates about my videos and when they're going to come out, as well as teasers. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Michael Williams, RC World Discord server, Casey Nix, Ben Rees, Dave Armstrong, Joe Jenkins, Rob Bettingfield, Caden Merks, Ron Chang, Ian Petrie, Keith McDonald, and especially Morrison Watt. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.